Now this is a charge compensator. Now it looks, for the most part, it actually looks like a uh, suction line dryer, although it is listed here as a muffler. <laughs> so the UL listings for a muffler. Okay. This is a charge compensator. It only actually works on heat pumps with a TXV expansion device. Anyway, that's what this thing is. It is supposed to control the charge. Now, I'm going to cut this thing apart and we'll look at the inside and I'll explain how the silly thing works. Okay, when looking at the inside of this, it really is very simple. It does really look like, uh, well, I guess it could look like a muffler. Uh, but it looks like a suction line dryer to me. So it's just got a pipe that goes straight through. Now in heat mode, this pipe is the suction line, so it's cold. Now there's a tap on the side. Other than the pipes going through this, uh, this is the only tap. This goes to the liquid line. Now I've got a diagram here, so let's take a look at it. Now you can see with my crummy diagram, in heat mode. So what's going to happen in heat mode? Okay, this is uh, the hot gas line is coming here, going through the condenser and through the expansion device to the evaporator to the suction line which goes through this compensator. Now what's going to happen with this uh, system is when it's colder outside there's not as much refrigerant necessary so what we've got is it's not evaporating as much refrigerant here in the evaporator as it would normally so where does that refrigerant go it goes out here into the condenser. Because we have a TXV, it is going to feed enough refrigerant into the evaporator to get a superheat that corresponds with what the expansion device wants. So it'll evaporate a, an amount of refrigerant depending on superheat. That may be very low in cold outdoor temperatures. So that refrigerant ends up going through the discharge line and backing up behind this TXV. Now I've seen this happen. I couldn't figure out what it was, but especially when you had uh, mismatched indoor and outdoor units where I'd say have a train outdoor unit and a carrier indoor unit, something like that, then Sometimes you would get these mismatches and they wouldn't balance out well. And the head pressure, even though you got plenty of air moving across the coil, now this is the indoor coil in heat, there's plenty of air moving across it. The liquid line temperature has a lot of subcool, probably more than it should have, and you still have high head. That's because instead of having, say, liquid refrigerant here, we've also got it up here. And maybe even up into here. So with all this liquid refrigerant, I have very little area to condense the refrigerant into a liquid. So we have too much liquid. It's going to back up behind that TXV. So what do we do? In comes the charge compensator. So let's look at what happens. In heat mode, the hot gas is coming in here to the condenser that's inside the house. It goes through and it's being fed through the TXV to the evaporator, which is the outdoor coil goes through the coils of the evaporator and because the TXV works on superheat uh, it will have a certain amount of superheat but it will be cold much colder than the liquid line so as 
the refrigerant starts to build up here and fills up these coils, then it is going to feed into this thing. Why does it go in there? It goes in there because it's cold. And refrigerant likes the coldest place. So it's going to start drawing refrigerant out of that condenser and tend to balance it closer. Now, sizing of these things, I can't really tell you much about them. I really don't know how they should be sized. It would seem that it would eventually starve the, uh, uh, the condenser. However, if it does start to starve the condenser, that'll mean the superheat will go up so this will warm and it won't bring as much in. That may be the only way that they control it. But anyway, this is how they work. And the addition of these things has actually made quite a bit of difference to the way these things operate and uh, has increased the efficiency somewhat. Because like I said, I have seen that happen before. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I assumed something was out of balance and the system just wasn't balancing right, which essentially it was because we need more refrigerant in cooling than we do heat. Now, what happens when this thing goes into defrost? Well, all this stuff reverses. We will now have the refrigerant moving this way because this is a discharge line. And what it's going to do is heat this thing up and it's just going to shove that refrigerant back in there. If we also have a TXV for uh, the indoor coil, then the refrigerant will come back like this. What's refrigerant will dump in here and as it goes through, this valve is going to throttle when the superheat goes down. Does not mean you don't need an accumulator on these things. I don't know. Some of them don't have it. Some of them do. But a lot of heat pumps don't have accumulators at all with scroll compressors. So uh, there may be some engineering I don't understand there. But flood back is probably not a big issue. A lot of guys have talked about flood back in the defrost. I'm not sure it's a big issue, uh, but it is something to think about. Anyway, that's how that silly thing works. The next one I'm going to talk about is I'm going to uh, compare this to a liquid line receiver and see if we can come up with the differences between the two. That's it on this one.